everybody. Um, okay, so Representative Kelly will be um, right in. She's just using the restroom right now, um, so we'll begin. Um, but thank you very much for um, attending the Municipal DuPage's October meeting. Um, we think that this is a really terribly important topic, especially since each municipality is um, determining what each municipality is doing. Um, earlier this morning, we had the county board decide that they were opting out of all um, county um, unincorporated areas. So there's all, virtually um, a whole wide range of spectrum of acceptance of the law that is gonna be the law of our state. Um, no matter what, on January 1st, this is the law of our state in various communities and municipalities have a very different idea of looking at it and accepting it um, for their own interesting um, issues. For example, we have a municipality, um, Naperville Municipality, which is the third largest um, city in Illinois, is on the March 17th ballot, is gonna have a referenda on opting in or opting out. The city council has punted on the issue and they basically asked the electorate to decide, um, which is an interesting way to go about it. They've decided you know, that they can't decide in essence and that they want everyone else to. So it's very interesting to see how that's going down. Um, so we have a, a fabulous guest, um, Representative Kelly Cassidy, who led the way in the state to um, legalize um, re adult youth recreational use cannabis. Um, and I'm gonna give you a little bit of an introduction about her. Um, as an organizer, a legislative director, and a mom, Kelly Cassidy has spent the last 20 years living her values. Whether fighting for the rights of women and the LGBTQ um, community as an activist, working for smarter criminal justice system within the state's, attorney, uh, state's attorney's office, or ensuring that her three boys have safe spaces to play in our community, she has devoted the last two decades to making government more accessible, efficient, and effective. Those experiences, both inside and outside of the system, have afforded her great insight into how to be a better, more, re more responsive and effective state representative for the 14th District. Cassidy's first job in Chicago was as a legislator director for the Chicago Office of the National Organization of Women, which was an outstanding introduction to the inner workings of government. Individuals often found the legislative process too confusing and legislators, legislators inaccessible. It was Cassidy's job to empower women to advocate on their own behalf of legislators. Highlights of her tenure included aiding in the efforts to pass the Human Rights and Family and Medical Leave Acts, as well as defeating bill after bill attacking a woman's right to choose. Locally, she worked to help pass the city and county humane human rights ordinances and fought to resume abortion services at County, now Stroger Hospital. She has often said that one of her most satisfying jobs was running Illinois Senator John Cullerton's office. As a constituent lead, Cassidy knew at the end of the day, someone had their problem solved because of her efforts. It also became clear how often constituent contacts drove a legislative agenda. Their input often led to the introduction of legislation, intervention with a state agency at the policy level, and real change that affected far, far more people than those few that brought the problem to the office's attention. And the rest is, uh, is on, your, um, is on your, your piece here. But um, the source is her fabulous um, website. I highly recommend you checking um, it out and her out. So with that, um, please uh, let's listen to Representative Kelly Cassidy. You just need to be kind of close to it. Okay. It's very, I really should have brought a paper copy so I could see better, but part of me feels like I could do this in my sleep, having spent the better part of the last six years. Um, oh, cool. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I mean, actually, before we dive in on this, I just want to give a little shout out, well, two shout outs, frankly. First of all, to all of y'all with the petitions out, 
I've been referring to clipboards as the fashion accessory of the season, so you incredibly stylish beasts, I love you. Um, and then to my beloved Breen Slayer, your state representative, Tara Costa Howard, for, for having been such a wonderful sister and badassery this year. I am uh, so grateful to have gotten to meet you and work with you. and. Um, I'm guessing this isn't my first trip out to DuPage County this year, so um, or next year, because I'm committed to making sure you have to deal with me for a very long time. <laughs> um, so, you know, we we are in the middle of a massive change sweeping the country, and Illinois has taken a leading role in it. Um, when we started this process, it, it's actually been six years of work to get to where we are today with passage of the. Um, Cannabis Tax and Regulate Act. We were the 11th state to fully legalize, in, in other words, uh, to, to not just have medical, but to, to also give uh, adult use um, access as well. And we were the first state to fully do so legislatively. And that was, it's important for a couple of reasons. Um, those first nine states that, that did it, um, they did it by ballot referendum. Ballot referenda are written by the people who can afford to be in the room. And any of you who've ever voted on a ballot referendum, it's a couple sentences long. And then the legislators have to interpret the will of that paragraph. Um, and that's led to some, you know, sort of formulaic approaches around the country, but nothing that has, has carried through in a more comprehensive way in the way we went about it. Um, we were, Vermont actually fully legalized by legislation, but they did not create a marketplace. So there are two places in the country that have this, this hybrid situation where um, possession is legal, but sales are not legalized. So people land in this weird middle ground. Um, in Washington, D.C., they have what they call farmer's markets, where it's like a pop-up. <laughs> <laughs> and you're not allowed to buy it, but you're allowed to buy a baseball card and get some free samples. And so that's that's how they do it in states with this middle ground. It's really, yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's not great, um, especially since the reality of this. And and you know, for for the, those of us who worked on this for a long time, you know, we came to it for different reasons. And and Heather Staines, my Senate lead sponsor, likes to talk about the fact that when she first came into office, that was the beginning of the discussion of medical cannabis use. And she wasn't sure where she was going to land, but she educated herself and became more familiar. And by the time it came time to vote for medical cannabis, what she realized completely was that prohibition doesn't work. It hasn't worked. Um, and that was borne out by the research and the work we did. We really went about this in a way to look at how, the other, how all the other states had done it. We did a lot of research and a lot of travel and had a lot of conversations with folks in those states and we always asked a handful of questions. What do you wish you had, had done? What do you wish you hadn't done? What do you wish you had been able to do? What do you wish you had been able to do differently? Um, every single one of them wished they had been able to do it in a much more public way through the legislative process the way we did. At the end of the process, I think I had put 20 some thousand miles on my car. We had somewhere like three dozen public hearings, uh, or town halls and public hearings. Um, we had over 100 stakeholder meetings um, because we wanted to ensure that we brought, took in all the information that we could to make sure that we crafted it in the, in the way that was gonna be the most um, effective. Make sure I hit the right button. No, that's not it. There we go. What we found as we looked at other states, usage rates don't change in any dramatic way um, post legalization. You see a slight decrease in most states among youth use. Um, and I like to point out the guy on my corner, I've never seen him card anybody. I can see him from my couch, so I get to watch him a lot. <laughs> never once have I seen him card. So it's a natural presumption that at least minimally you're gonna have tougher access for people under age. 87% um, of teens report that cannabis is easier to access than alcohol, which seems like a really good reason to make access to cannabis about the same as we make access to alcohol, to, to make it harder. Um, there are ongoing national studies of um, usage rates. 
I assume that the usage rates that we see are pretty conservative because I don't know about you, but I tell the doctor that I have a glass of wine with dinner. <laughs> People are gonna be even more circumspect when talking about using cannabis. Although I've noticed that physicians have taken a different approach to asking this question now. They're, they're asking it in a much more matter of fact way right alongside alcohol. So I think that, that even physicians are getting a little bit more comfortable in talking to folks about it. So the, the most recent survey showed that 780,000 uh, Illinoisans report uh, usage in the past month or regular usage. Given that we have about 60,000 patients registered, something like that, um, that means a whole lot of people who don't have access to legal cannabis. And what that means is that they are buying products that are not tested, that are not regulated, that do not have any labeling. I used, I used to carry this with me all the time and I kind of stopped after passing it. Um, but uh, the labels on, these, on this packaging, this is not your Big Brother's film canister or Ziploc baggie. Um, what you see when you look at one of these packages, first of all, it's, they're very, very difficult to open. So we'll start with that. Um, I actually passed one around in caucus and I think only one person got it open. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, and it, there was nothing in it, by the way. It was a sample. <laughs> Um, but, but there's, you know, on the label, it, it talks about what fertilizers were used. It talks about what natural pesticides were used because Illinois prohibits any chemical pesticides. It talks about that it shows that it's been tested for mold and heavy metals. Um, and then it talks about the, the, the potency and the appropriate dosage. And there are warning labels just like there would be on any other products that you don't want in the hands of children or pregnant people. Um, so it's very, very different than what might be in people's imaginations. And we did a lot of time, we spent a lot of time taking colleagues and community leaders into tour um, cultivation centers because it's also not what you would expect. These are incredibly high tech facilities with, with incredible security. Um, so this is a very sophisticated operation. And as we approached this, what was most important to all of us, and I, I come out of, and you heard from um, if you didn't doze off during my bio, you heard about my work in the criminal justice system. Um, and you know that, that was my focus, that was my approach to this, was ensuring that we were gonna right the wrongs of the war on drugs and the, the communities that had been harmed by it. And so that was always critical, that was always central to our formatting of this. So this is the state of the law today. Um, we have our medical cannabis program. Oh, apparently the number's been updated. 71,000 patient cards. Um, but what that doesn't reference is folks who, like a lot of the patients have terminal illnesses. So some of those folks might have died. Lots of folks stopped using their cards, things like that. So it's not a great measure. Um, when the governor signed the, the um, Bob Morgan bill making the medical, medical cannabis program permanent, um, he also uh, put more conditions in place, all the conditions that the Rauner administration um, denied through the, the petition process were added in, back into the program, which allowed, so uh, Illinois had the most restrictive medical cannabis program in the country when I came in. Patients had to be fingerprinted before they could get access to the program. We, we, we eliminated that last year um, in the opioid alternative program bill. Um, but we also had the smallest number of conditions and, and in many ways they didn't make a lot of sense like you, and I'm going to get it wrong, but you could have all sort of colitis but not irritable bowel syndrome, you know, the, the conditions that, were, that are often interchangeable were not even included. So uh, never mind that you couldn't get one for chronic pain or, or some of the things that, that folks find cannabis most useful for. Um, so, uh, so our medical cannabis program, we did a decriminalization bill or what we called uniform civil enforcement uh, back in 2016. Actually, we first did it in 2015, but Rauner vetoed it. Um, I, I think I hold the record for Rauner vetoes. <laughs> it's a point of pride. Um, so this is one of my bills so nice I passed it twice. Um, so so the, the Uniform Civil Enforcement of Cannabis Bill was really, and frankly, foundational to how we went about this from a social justice perspective when we got to legalization. There were well north of 200 local ordinances around the state. There's no central repository of ordinances, so this was um, an intern army who finally, they, we kind of stopped after 200. Um, uh, local ordinances that were, um, it was discretionary whether you could be arrested or get a ticket. 
and the amounts vary from you know two grams to no amount listed. The, the fines varied from very minimal to huge. Um, the tracking of them varied. So we wanted to create a uniform system for civil enforcement of cannabis for low level possession. So 10 grams and below was a ticket. And the other piece that was so important that, I, that was the hill I was willing to die on in that one was ensuring that there were no collateral consequences for those tickets. So if you pay your ticket, the arrest is automatically expunged. And that was the first time in the state of Illinois that, that the concept of automatic expungement was, was explored. We had to invent it. Um, lots of folks didn't want to, um, but, but we've, that's been working really well since July of 2016 when that went into, um, went into law. And we, we created, because Illinois didn't have a DUI standard, for cannabis, actually. It was any presence of THC in your system at all, no matter how minuscule, um, which, believe it or not, I mean, some tough on crime folks might think that that would be better, like a zero tolerance approach. Mm -hmm. However, it was very easy to disprove uh, or to, to cast reasonable doubt. So it was very hard to make a DUI charge stick unless there was literal impairment shown. Um, and so uh, this was one of those where a solution actually was agreeable from both perspectives. So we use the standard that exists in Colorado, Washington, and Oregon, which allows for measurement in blood or saliva of the presence of THC. <clears throat> it's still flawed, straight up, still not great. Um, we still have the issue of uh, residual presence of THC in your system. This is one that works against women because it's stored in your fatty tissues. So we just have more fatty tissues. And so it stays with us longer, um, but it's better than what we had. And what we're seeing now, science is getting better. We've created a field sobriety test that, that uses saliva. It's been in minimal use in Illinois. The, the, the funding that'll go into law enforcement will allow a field sobriety test to come into play a little bit more usefully um, in the state. But prior to this, we didn't have a standard. And I mentioned, um, and then we had the opioid alternative program. Sorry, I thought this, there was two more on this, on this one. The opioid alternative program went into, into effect at the end of last year. And what that did was allow um, patients to request access, temporary access to the medical cannabis program instead of uh, access to an opioid prescription. We knew that, um, we know that opioid addiction can set in within days. People don't have time to wait uh, for, for approval. We, we had wait, wait times of up to 120 days for patients to get their cards. So that was an opportunity for us to actually fix the whole system. We, we created um, instant access uh, for folks so you get your card within a day or two um, in both cases um, because there was an acknowledgement that we had to address that on the opioid side. So our cannabis program, um, we have uh, 21 indoor cultivation facilities licensed. Only 20 of them are operational. Currently one of them has been tied up in litigation since day one. Um, there are 60 permissible um, uh, dispensary licenses, only 55 have been issued. Those five outstanding licenses, I, you know, it's still unclear what the administration's plans are to, in terms of letting those out. Um, and under the medical program, they were sorted by state police district. Um, under the, the adult use program, we've changed that a little bit to create a little bit more thoughtful and less arbitrary distribution um, statewide. So, how did I spend my last six years? Um, so we, we created the opportunity for adults 21 and over to purchase up to 30 grams. Non-residents can purchase up to 15 grams. I get asked about this with some regularity. Why is it different for in-state and out-of-state? Uh, two answers. One, this is pretty standard across the country in legaliz legalization states. States want to be mindful of uh, interstate leakage. We don't want to be the source of uh, gray market or illicit market cannabis in other states. Um, and so what, uh, so that, that tends to be the approach. Um, and uh, one other point of pride that we found as we were making our way through the state and, and doing our research, um, our, our program is so well regulated here in Illinois that we're not finding our product out of state. Uh, when we talked to other states and we talked to law enforcement here who had been reaching out to people around, around them, our product isn't leaking because we've got such tight controls on the, the growers and on the, um, the distributors. Within the, the Hospital 1438, medical uh, card holders can grow up to five plants per household. Um, public consumption remains illegal. 
um, driving under the influence remains illegal. Um, and uh, on the public consumption side, there, there is an issue around this issue of social justice. One thing that we saw, again, in our looking around the country um, was that uh, post-legalization, we saw disparate, disparate impact of enforcement of public consumption on communities of color. And you know, some of that is sort of what we see with you know, over-policing in general, but it also speaks directly to this prohibition on public consumption because if I don't own my home, my landlord can tell me I can't consume in my home. If I live in uh, subsidized housing, that's a federal law that you can't consume in that space. So there, there, there are issues around there, and ironically enough, this has become another place of a strange alliance because um, in Vegas, they have a huge problem with the hospitality industry because those hotels are also casinos which have federal oversight, so they have, they have huge risk with regard to folks consuming in those in their facilities. So there is a, a growing movement towards creating what are called social use spaces. Um, here in Illinois, we have, a, we have the toughest uh, smoke-free act in the country. So we're, 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 that's actually something that's gonna have to get tweaked a little bit to make it work so that you can have the equivalent of a hookah lounge or a cigar club. This is not about a, a, a bong section at Applebee's. <laughs> Um, that's never going to happen. And it's also very much in, in, in the control of the local government. We wanted to make sure that that was um, locally decided. And two, local control. So under the medical program, we had a very one-size-fits-all approach to how these facilities would be located. Um, and what we found, like for example, where I live in Rogers Park in the city of Chicago, probably, if not, the most liberal community in the state, then it's right up there and I'll arm wrestle Will Guzzardi for it over Logan Square, and I'll beat him. Um, but <laughs> the, the, there were only two pieces of property in the 49th Ward in my, in my neighborhood that met the requirements for locating a dispensary. They had to be, um, I think it was a thousand feet from parks, schools, and daycares. And, and in fact, when the, um, when the, when the guy who got the license to open a dispensary in Rogers Park, um, by the time he got through the licensing, licensing process, and you had to own, have possession of the property before your license could be processed, by the time he got through that process, somebody had opened a daycare center across the street, and he had to start all over again. He, it, I mean, it was, a, it was a hot mess. He finally opened up in the middle of last year. Um, zoning ordinances, so this is what we're hearing in the news every day, right? People are opting in, opting out. Um, for folks in areas that are hearing about opting out, hi DuPage County, how's it going? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, the, the proportion of opt out is actually, we're still, it, it's not as bad as it seems, frankly. Like we're, that's what everybody's talking about, that's what's making the news. But if you look at California and Colorado and other areas, they actually had higher opt out rates than we're seeing so far. So I, I think we're gonna be okay. Um, I think, you know, for the most part, some of these local governments maybe could tap the brakes a little bit and, and think it through before they, um, they, before they go too far. Um, and then it allows for a local tax of up to 3% on sales, and that's an area that I've been pretty vocal about. Um, we have seen in other states, again, with our, the, the 10 rear view mirrors we had the benefit of, um, if you overtax this product, if you start from a place of doing this to, to bring in revenue, you're gonna bring in less revenue in the long run. Um, we saw in other states where they went, they went to the max, they went as high as they could, they, they you know, thought that they had won the lottery, they, were, they had all the money, they had all the visions of you know, money raining on them. And the reality is, you're competing with a street market that is not regulated, that doesn't have those fixed overhead costs. And so what we saw were price wars in some of those states. And, and we'll see some of that anyway. I mean, that, that's, that's the reality. What we know is that it takes about five years for the market to mature um, and, and put more succinctly. It takes about five years for some people to break up with their weed guy. These are long-term relationships. Um, and so you know, bringing people into the legal marketplace takes a little bit of time. Folks have to get used to um, the, that accessibility, they, got, they, they have to, you know, they have to get used to it. 
We have maintained employers' rights to maintain a zero tolerance policy. That's something that's been um, getting duped out in the courts all over the country. We've got competing decisions coming down. Some of them relate to patients. Some of them relate to folks in public safety positions. We felt like the best approach for state policy at this point was to maintain that zero tolerance policy, um, and, and we'll see where the, where the law matures. Same with landlords' rights to have those conditions on their, on their leases. Um, I get this question a lot in my community because I've got Sheridan Road and all the high rises. Condos will also be able to add it to their covenants that, that the whole facility um, is smoke free. Very, very strict laws about packaging and advertising. Um, and then that label that you see there, the, the barcode, that will take you all the way back to the original plant, the seed plant. Everything is tracked from seed to sale so that um, if there is a recall issue, it's, it's very easy to pull that back in. But it also allows us as regulators to main strict, maintain strict controls over that supply chain and, and, and avoid leakage. When you go into one of those grows, like the picture of the, the, the grow room, and if you're talking to one of the employees and you see them pick a leaf off, you're gonna see them carry it around with them. Nobody's gonna throw anything on the ground or in the garbage can. It's gonna go into a, a secure container. Um, because everything is weighed in and weighed out. They can't even, they, they have to grind up the waste until it is completely unusable and mixed with dirt and weighed um, before they can dispose it. So it, it's, it's kind of amazing to see the, the degree to which these things, um, the, the degree of control that goes into this. So we talked a bit at the beginning, but I, this is where we get to get into the part that really is my heart on this bill, which is the, the, the equity and restorative justice components. We, we talked about it at the beginning as a three-legged stool. Restoration, access, We'll get there. <laughs> oh, oh, and, and repair, sorry. Um, it's right in front of me. So on the expungement side, we are, <laughs> I haven't had to do this in a while. And you, I think you've been to at least one of these. <laughs> but, so, so we have um, set about, we've already started the process of the expungements. Um, of, and I just got a new number, but I'm gonna use the old one because I haven't saved the new number in my brain. 770,000 records are what, what are eligible for expungement. And most of those will be done completely automatically. And that's every class four felony and below. Mm -hmm. And as we talked about this, as we went into this, I talked about, I'm gonna to refer to my little friend on the corner again, the kid on the corner, right? I wanted to make sure that the kid on the corner was taken care of. I wanted to make sure that that kid on the corner had an opportunity, whether it's that he wanted to move into the legitimate marketplace or if he just wanted to have access to a work life without a record. Um, and so, so those expungements are hugely important. And quite frankly, when we looked around the country, nobody has undertaken anything this big. This number, the, the, the 770,000 uh, records, is probably 100 times more than any other state has even attempted. Um, and it's way more than, than every state combined has done. Um, last check, California was like 50,000 records, which a state like California, right? Um, and that actually, that's what informed our desire to it, for it to be automatic because we saw very low participation rates in California. You had to take a, a proactive step in California. Once you did it, once you took that step, it was pretty much automatic. Um, but, but we didn't even want that to have to happen. We wanted to make sure that, that, it, that it was done without any efforts. Um, under the, the opportunity component, here in Illinois, right now, there are only two categories of licensure. So as we showed at the beginning, you've got the cultivators and you've got the dispensaries. Under the cultivation, you've got the, the processing and creation of all infused products. You, they, they do their own transportation. Um, and those facilities are, as you saw, um, so we wanted to, to create some more opportunities, more avenues for access to the industry. So we, we, we've created the, the uh, three new li um, licensing categories. So we created a craft grow, which is a smaller footprint. Um, the the, the full-size grow uh, is estimated to be about 10 to 12 million from application to doors open. And so we wanted to create a, an opportunity to, to be part of that growth um, without needing to have access to that kind of capital. 
So we created a craft row, which is going to be between five and 14,000 square feet of canopy. Um, so that's a, it's still a, a significant um, footprint, but not anything near some of these 100,000 square foot facilities. The reason for that size was based on this, the scale at which you have to turn to automation, which then becomes too cumbersome and too capital intensive. If you get that to that point as a craft grower, you can flip and, and, and you know, try to become a, a large scale one. Um, we created a transport license because frankly, as these guys get bigger and more busy, they're not gonna wanna do their own driving anyway. Transport is the easiest point of access into the industry, the lowest capital investment. Um, and these guys need it. They need to move product between facilities. They need to be able to move cash um, and they need to do it in a secure way. So transport license, um, a uh, infuser license. So again, uh, here in Illinois, currently, if you could have the best brownie recipe on the planet, and unless you have an in with one of the 20 operating cultivators, you can't get your product to market. When you go into other states, other legal states, and you go into these dispensaries, the array of products is amazing. There's so much room for innovation and entrepreneurship in that space. And so we wanted to make sure that that was an opportunity as well. So we created a, an infuser license. Those are the new licensing categories. And then we wanted to make sure that we created avenues to get into those spaces. So we have a first of its kind at a state level revolving loan fund funded entirely by the existing industry. Their license fees in this round are funding our capacity to expand and, and bring equity into, into the industry. So there'll be a $30 million loan fund. Um, they, there's fee reductions for social equity applicants, and I'll explain that in a second. Um, and we've created a community college training program where um, colleges, uh, community colleges around the state, there'll be eight that can uh, get a plant handling license with the Department of Agriculture to create a curriculum. There have, some, there have been some schools that have created a theory curriculum, a book-based curriculum, but the ability to be hands-on in plant handling um, is, is a change. And, uh, and then 25% of the proceeds of, uh, from the revenue will go into, back into communities that are identified as uh, disproportionately impacted areas uh, to, to um, restore the harm done by the war on drugs. The licensing piece around social equity applicants, uh, those disproportionately impacted areas are created from data based on um, cannabis arrests, poverty, violence, returning citizens, all of the pieces that go into looking for spaces where the war on drugs has had the most impact. Applicants from those areas are what, what we call social equity applicants. You can be an applicant, you can be a contractor, you know, there, there are different ways to, to achieve that, but we wanted to make sure that we created opportunity in those communities that have been harmed by the war on drugs. I, I went into, I did a lot of that already, oops. Um, so this goes into a little bit more on the, um, uh, on the expungement. So the completely automatic will be 30 grams or under. And when I talked about the, the ticket bill, that changed the, the scale, what, the, what it had been historically. Historically, 30 grams and under was a class four felony. When we did the ticket bill, we, made the, we dropped the whole ladder down a step. And so for the last couple of years, uh, a class four felony has been um, up to 500 grams. And so for those folks in that window, there's a semi-automatic process, if you will. Um, and then, uh, you know, we've, we've been meeting already with all of these agencies involved because it's a lot of moving parts. We've got these folks already communicating with each other about where they are in the process and those files and those records have already started moving through the process. So folks in the, um, the, the reality of the expungement situation is that it takes a long time. So if you were applying for an expungement now, it could take, a, a, it could take years to, to solve for that. So we wanted to make sure that, that folks didn't have to wait for us to dig through, in some cases, multi-file boxes in the back of a warehouse somewhere. Because here in Illinois, every county has its own record storage system. Some are fully digitized. I happen to live in a, a, a county, a, a court uh, circuit that uh, might still be the single largest industrial user of carbon paper in the world. So um, I, I like to joke that the, um, 
the, the current circuit court clerk in her last election did a video about how much she had modernized the office. This is a weird aside, but she did this video sitting in front of a flashing DOS screen. <laughs> it went viral. It was great. Um, so folks who have an expungeable conviction, but it hasn't been expunged yet, can still um, work in the industry. We took away that uh, that barrier. Um, people couldn't have a license, but they also couldn't work in the industry. And that was, again, early in my research. Um, I was out in Colorado at, a, at one of the very first grows, and the, the guy there was talking about the fact that he was having trouble hiring people. He was having trouble finding people qualified to work with the plant. And so he funded a curriculum at a college because everybody that had plant knowledge, that had plant experience, also had a record and couldn't get hired. So that was one, an early tag that I hung on to and, and, and um, made sure that we took care of. I always jump ahead of the slides. Okay, so we did this one. So the, the R3 program, um, where the, the cannabis revenue is gonna go back into those communities, the things that were really important to us were to make sure that we weren't dictating how the money should be spent in these communities. Um, you know, the harm was done from outside. The repair can come from inside and be driven by the, the needs and desires of the folks in those communities. And so the R3 board will be inclusive of folks, um, stakeholders in, in these issues and in these communities to ensure that we can um, bring the money in in ways that will truly help. Some communities might need a mental health clinic. Some communities might want job training. Some communities might want to do something about vacant lots. These are all appropriate uses, but it's all community driven. So this is the full distribution of the funds. So I talked about the five year window. Um, we anticipate that at maturity, the, the tax revenue, and this is the sales tax alone. This is not any of the other revenues that come in as a result, whether we're talking about real estate taxes or employer, new employee businesses, um, the, the, those sorts of taxes. This is just the sales tax alone. So 35% will go to the general revenue fund, 10% to the bill backlog, 8% going to law enforcement looking at the training and the materials they need. One of the complaints we got, so the ticket bill was supposed to fund the, the equipment to do the roadside testing, but most communities were smart enough to get their own, if they didn't already have their own ticket, uh, or if their ticket didn't comply, they were pretty smart and they caught up with that really quick. And so most of the tickets remained local tickets. So there was not a lot of state revenue from the ticket. So we wanted to make sure that we took care of that and made sure that there were, we were explicit in the, in the bill about this as well, whether it's for roadside testing or really the most effective thing right now for DUI is DREs, drug recognition experts, because impairment is impairment regardless of the cause. And so, you know, that's really the, 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 the best uh, approach. Um, public education and safety campaigns, we talked about youth use. We wanna make sure that we're also doing prevention campaigns around this. I've, I've seen some really horrible ones from other states and I've seen some pretty great ones from other states. And, you know, we, we talked about this a lot on, <laughs> nobody's laughing about it, no, the eggs. Um, you know, the, the reality is we expect kids to ace the AP bio exam, but then we want them to watch us crack two eggs in a skillet and talk about your brain on drugs and expect them to respect that. <laughs> And the reality is we can talk about neuroreceptors and addiction pathways, and we can give them good information, and we can let them make good decisions. And what we've seen, Colorado's got the longest data. Colorado's always had the highest rate of youth use, so everybody's gonna, we all hear, Colorado has the highest rate of youth use. They did before it was legal. They always have. It's Colorado. Um, but so, so they, what they've seen though is a steady decrease year on year of uh, youth reporting regular use. So that's the public education and safety campaigns. Wanted to make sure that we started to undo some of the harm of the last four years on our mental health and safety net uh, system. So making sure that we're, that we're putting funds into mental health services and substance abuse, and then 25% into the R3 program uh, to repair communities harm. So this is the licensing timeline, which is where we get to the part where people want to get in the business. And there are a bunch of different dates. And I will tell you, everything that, that you're seeing here is available on my website. Um, I've got a ton of information and links to departments as well. 
uh, information so that folks who are interested in looking at whether they want to get into the industry, there's a ton of resources there. Um, and this licensing timeline, frankly, every time we talked about dates, I would get a bit befuddled because I'm a very visual person. So this was really my cheat sheet, um, but, but it's become incredibly useful to share with others. Um, so where we are now, the wave one dispensary applications were published. That will be for up to 75 new dispensaries. They're dispersed around the state uh, according to Bureau of Labor Statistics districts. I think we're in the same one. I think Chicago, I think it goes, I think it goes as far as here. I'm not certain. Um, there will be the opportunity for 47 of them in, in, if, if we're in the same BLS district. I feel like we are. I feel like we probably are. Um, you can't have 47 in Chicago. I mean, right, exactly. Although, you know, in, in unlimited license states, it does happen, and that's why we're a limited license state. We wanted to do this in a really thoughtful and controlled way, and as you walk through this timeline, you'll see, you know, so we're doing the Wave 1 dispensary applications. The retail sales begin on January 1. As the, the Wave 1 dispensary applications are awarded on, by May 1, then you get the craft infuser and transporter license awarded in July. Then there's a hard stop. We're putting a lid on the industry because we wanna make sure that the social equity proposal that we put forth, which is based on case law around the country, every mm -hmm. single state that has, that has done this has tried to find a way to bring some equity and diversity to the industry. Nationwide, the estimates are that the cannabis industry is about 4% minority. Um, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of reasons for that. Some of them we've talked about here, the capital needs, the criminal barriers, um, the, the lack of banking access, the lack of small business assistance, those sorts of things. Um, and so we, we wanted to ensure that if this process, this race neutral process on social equity applicants didn't work, that we had an opportunity to hit a reset button. And so by January 1st, we have to complete what's called a disparity study. That is the trigger for which, by which you could do a more uh, race-based set-aside program if the social equity system doesn't work. And at that point, there will be uh, new waves of licensing after that. So again, all the, the different types of licenses, almost all of them are controlled by the Department of Agriculture. Um, dispensary licenses, which are the ones that are active right now, that's the application that's active right now, is the Department of Financial and Professional Regulation. All of it will be overseen by the, um, the we're calling her the Tsarina, um, the, the Cannabis Tsar, uh, um, medical, or the, the Cannabis Coordinator, uh, and that's going to be Toy Hutchinson, who was one of the Senate sponsors, and she's resigning next week. Um, to, to take this on. She will be the first African-American woman czar in the country. Um, it's an incredibly exciting opportunity to make sure that we get this implementation done right. Um, so right now, IDFPR is where all the action is because those are the open applications. Um, January 1, the cultivation center, craft grower, infuser license, and transporter licenses, that all of that coming out of the Department of Agriculture, that's when those applications uh, go live. So tons of, of um, resources available on the web. Everything that's available um, on the IDFPR and Illinois, Illinois Department of Agriculture is also, I've got stuff within my website under, there's a, under issues, cannabis law information. I've got um, the, the IDFPR stuff, the Department of Agriculture stuff, as well as the Department of Commerce, Commerce and Economic Opportunity has released their loan fund information as well as some really, really good information about avoiding scams. I think one of the things that disturbs me the most that I hear about is folks who call me and say, you know, somebody told me that for $120,000 they can get me a license. For all of the money in the world, I couldn't get you a license. Anybody who tells you that they can get you a license is lying. Consultants can charge you to write a really good application and they can have a really good track record. That's different. Um, but be mindful, be, be wary uh, on that front because there, there are definitely going to be bad actors in every area, but this is a huge opportunity uh, area. So folks, um, folks have been reporting, uh, hearing things like that, including you know, people doing job training, you pay me $1,000 and you'll have a certificate that's meaningless. 
and most of the people won't want to hire you because they know that you've been trained in a in effective way. So there, there's there's a lot going on. It's an incredible time. I was just uh, on a panel with the deputy governor of New York. They are essentially lifting our bill and and uh, carrying it over and attempting to pass theirs by next year. Their goal is April uh, by the end of April of next year to pass a bill that is modeled after ours. Um, we are all eyes are on us um, to get this right. So no worries. Um, but we're, I hear from a different state every day, uh, New Zealand called. <laughs> um, it, it's kind of amazing. So folks are really watching this as, as really the first opportunity to, to do this in a more comprehensive way. I find I do better with questions, so toss them at me. And it, you don't have to stick to cannabis. You can ask me about anything. Uh, I have one, uh, since we're gonna have the accusing license mm -hmm. later. Yeah. Uh, Day one, that we currently have it in the medical dispensaries, edibles, and yes. non smokers. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the current products, but it's just very limited because, in terms of your ability to make how many products in one space. Right. Um, and so most have a line of edibles, um, as well as tinctures, um, balms is another very uh, popular uh, use and very effective use. So you'll see a lot of those products. They all exist already, it's just the opportunity to have more variety. Yes. Yeah, um, the conditions that were added to medical marijuana, is that in effect now? Or is yes, that, that is in effect now. Right. That was effective immediately. Yes. So what are we doing about this cash economy problem between us and the feds? I know that uh, Sean Caston has been working on a bill to get exemptions. And this, this, this kind of safety issue here, there's money laundering yep. possibilities, there's all kinds of uh, dangers Yep. For cash economy, so I don't there's only so much the state can do. What is your thinking about how we're going to relate to feds? Sure. So a couple things. What we have seen actually, um, in spite of all of those risks, is very few actual problems. Um, these licenses have huge value. So from a money laundering perspective, it's not worth it to them to risk them. So folks are are, are pretty cautious in their approaches. Um, and this is not just here in Illinois. This is you know looking at, at incidents around the country. You would think there'd be a lot of robberies and things like that. There really haven't been. In fact, violent crime are in the in the vicinity of dispensaries goes down largely because of the, the security requirements that we put on them. Um, so so yes, the risks are real. We've taken steps to to mitigate those risks. Um, and the reality is, in the bill, we talk about um, state chartered banks to give them a little bit more, uh, a little more um, comfort. Um, but we are still a largely unbanked industry in Illinois. Um, until the Trump administration, our industry was 85% banked, most of them by one bank. Um, and there was a, you know, their board was was sort of teetering <coughs> on on the balance. And then when when um, Sessions was the Attorney General and kept saber rattling on the issue they voted to kick everybody out. And so we went back to almost completely unbanked. People have little by little found some relationships. A couple of banks are doing it. Credit Union One is starting to do it. Treasurer Ferrerix has created an incentive program to try to get banks to do, do more in this space. Um, what we're really finding though is it's more that folks end up with using one-off relationships. Like, you know, I was a real estate developer and I had a really good banking relationship and so that bank is gonna let me do this much there. Um, people do a lot of other workarounds. I know a dispensary that has like three ATMs in there to keep their cash moving. So, it's you know, still, it's still a major it is absolutely 100%. And, you know, other states are, are figuring it out in other ways. Um, there are some dispensaries in Vegas that take debit cards but not credit cards. Like, you see different, different, uh, different approaches. But ultimately, what we need to do is have the SAFE Act passed, which is the, the main federal bill, that's the federal bill that just passed the, the, the House and it's in the Senate. There is hemp-related language in it as a sweetener to McConnell um, because he is he's making a lot of money on hemp. Um, uh, so hopefully the Senate will take it up. Um, and you know that was one where you know as it was advancing in the House, there were folks concerned that it didn't have any equity provisions in it. Um, I would argue that the most important equity provision is access to capital and banking. You can't get loans. Uh, so, so folks without relationships in the, the financial markets don't necessarily have access to working capital. Um, so, so, so that that was one of the arguments in the House that does not that really the Senate is just more conservative. So they're not concerned about it, you know, not having equity. They're just concerned about it being about cannabis.
but the hemp stuff in there might be helping. Um, so that could pass soon, but ultimately this is, uh, it, it, it's a major problem that states can't fully solve. How long will the expungement work? Will it be over time or all of a one day people, 770,000 yeah. people? No, <laughs> <laughs> I wish we could push a button. Um, so uh, Cook County State's Attorney Kim Fox is working with an organization called uh, Code for America that is attempting to do it in a, in a more automated way. And we've got the highest volume in Cook, obviously. Um, but the reality is, and I started to talk about this, every county has its own document storage methods. Um, and some of them literally will be moldy boxes in a corner somewhere. So it's, we've, we've set timelines based on how old the cases are. And so the newer, we're, you know, and I, I, I could make it up, but I, I would be lying what the dates are. But, you know, this date to this date has to be done by this date. This date to this date has to be done by this date. So it's done, it's done in waves. And, and as I said, nobody that's, it, it will not keep anyone from being eligible for licensure or employment as long as you have one of the cases that, that, that would be expendable. Um, I have a question. Um, so in Naperville, um, there's this church group, um, a Chinese church group um, that has um, really focused on opting out. Mm -hmm. And supposedly they've been funded by the Illinois <laughs> Policy Institute. And I don't think it would be the Illinois Policy Institute. They supported the bill. Okay. Maybe the Illinois Family Institute. Sorry, yeah. sorry, yes, yes, sorry. Long day. Anyway. It's really weird that I to have a bill supported by the Policy yeah. Institute, but it happens to me with some regularity because of my criminal justice work. But <laughs> so what they did was they um, at the when Neighborville had this um, long drawn out process, um, they showed up with um, they did a variety of different things, but they had um, all of the people had like saved their spots with this opt out shirt and it was on government property and so any which way what they ended up doing was they took their act on the road so they went to a lot of the different municipalities they papered over the Naperville and they oh I saw some pictures of that that was yeah and so they were going over and, and they, again it was um it was I guess spearheaded by this uh particular Chinese church and there a variety of people were wondering if um because of the background in some immigrant communities that is very anti-drug um, that is this another method of trying to divide um, different parts of the Democratic Party that would um, normally be voting together um, and when they're for example in Naperville they're putting this there's a whole football situation as to when they would put it on the ballot and who it would help mm -hmm. like if it was on the ballot in March it was deemed to have helped um, Democrats whereas if it was on the ballot in um, in November it was deemed to help Republicans right so what would you suggest if, if when you're, um, like for us locally, we're watching this one group of people go around and make this an issue? I've been doing battle with the Illinois Family Institute for... <laughs> I heard you giggle. I'm sorry, they're not allowed in my office. And they are not allowed to even come in the vestibule outside my office. I mean, the, the reality is they can be counted on to do whatever underhanded thing they need to do to advance their agenda. Um, I have a collection of things they call me. Um, I you should have worn your t-shirt. Oh, I could have worn my t-shirt, man. So more recently, um, I was referred to as an instigator of moral mayhem. And what's really <laughs> funny is like they think they're upsetting me, right? So I'm the instigator of moral mayhem. I'm the perverted promoter of all things homosexual. There's another one. Those are my two favorite. I joked when I when I got the instigator of moral mayhem one that I'm running out of tattoo space. I haven't really tattooed these <laughs> names on me, but um, so they they just they dinosaurs are going to dinosaur, and you know our our goal is to always out organize them, right? Um, that's harder when you know you've got a church bus that you're up against, but that's that's really been our battle. We we did that with marriage with them. We just had to out organize them. Uh, will recreational consumers be uh, have their license plate tagged for purchasing no. recreational? Is no. that something that's going to be addressed for medical patients then? I was actually in on the phone in the parking lot talking to Bob Morgan about that, about our efforts to do that. It's less than clear how 
the, the claim is that it, it shouldn't be, you should, your tag shouldn't be ta tagged, but it is. Yes. So um, we're working on language to try to get that in the trailer belt. Yeah, because not only as in-state police officers right. are able to see it out of state. So well. the out of state actually is more limited. Um, the the folks, and I, and I still don't understand quite how this works, but in state, yes, absolutely. Any local law enforcement or state trooper, if I'm a patient, and I have a medical cannabis card, when the, if they run my plate, they're gonna see that I have a medical cannabis card. In some cases, that has led to some harassment. Mm -hmm. um, people getting pulled over just on principle. Um, the, the issue he raised about out of state, um, we're not getting um, clarity on how they find out about it, because they're not supposed to. The only the Secretary of State and the State Police say the only way that they would be able to know out of state is if you had a stop on your record and it, and, and it was added to that stop. So, so that was our most recent answer in terms of how out of state uh, law enforcement are able to see that you have a medical cannabis card would be someone. So, so in that stop, the, the, the in-state stop that I got, let's just pretend it's me, they recorded my traffic stop. They noted that I had a medical cannabis card. That's what goes into the database that out of state has access to. But in terms of the technology of it, that's it's less than clear yet. Um, but we are working on it. Isn't that a HIPAA violation? One would think. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit more about um, so the, the local municipalities? I think what we're hearing at some of these meetings, other than the crazy talk, is um, you know these fears, these sort of, I guess, maybe old-fashioned fears of impaired driving and underage consumption. How do you see that playing out and um, for local police enforcement? Yeah. And then um, how do you also see the funding of that, too? Could, could you just go a little sure. bit deeper on that? So, you know, for every sky is falling story that goes along with this, the answer is usage rates don't change. Most people aren't gonna wake up on January 1 and decide that they want to consume cannabis. So, you know, I started to talk about youth, the, the youth use going down. The only demographic group where we see a slight uptick in usage is people over 50. It's a demographic that is familiar with the product, they're more law abiding and my knees hurt. You know, it's just that simple. Um, but you don't, you don't see dramatic increases in usage. And so this concept, this idea that you're suddenly going to have zombies driving down Roosevelt Road is simply not real. Um, you know, studies around the country, you know, you'll, the, the other side point, points to this one study in particular that, um, you know, talked about mayhem basically in Colorado. And it's been completely debunked uh, for completely unscientific methods. You know, they would report, they reported a 500% increase of cannabis related DUIs. And I don't remember if it was 500, but that's because in the year before the study, they didn't count them. <laughs> so that kind of stuff. So when you look at that kind of data, always dig down into what the source of it is. Um, and, and so, it, you know, that's the answer. Usage rates don't change. The sky isn't going to fall. It's where we are. Well, but, and also specifically, what power do police officers have to regulate the impaired driving? We have the same as it is today. Okay. Um, so you know, if I'm if I fall asleep at a traffic light, if I'm swerving, if I'm you know whatever, I am I am an impaired driver. If I can't pass a field sobriety test, doesn't matter what product put me in that situation. Um, you know, and, and back to the tagging of the plates, I, I offered to add tagging uh, for, to the prescription monitoring program for anybody with an opioid prescription, if you wanted to be fair. Um, yeah. That went well. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, the, it, it, there's not, it's just not real. Cal, can you talk about the funding though for the oh, sure. law enforcement, yep. that piece of it, because I know that's something that's come up a lot in our Yeah, case. absolutely. So, you know, we worked closely with law enforcement around the state with their, their various organizations, and ironically, they never moved off, absolutely not, hell no, don't pass this. Um, but they, they really, they, you know, but we want more. We want more. So that was fun. Um, so we front funded the monies to make sure that the state police and the various law enforcement agencies were able to gear up and be prepared um, with training, with equipment. Um, and that's 8% of the funding. Uh, or eight percent of the revenue stream will go will go to law enforcement for that. 
um, to make sure that they can purchase those cheek swabs, that they can do the additional trainings with their staff. Um, we also created a DUI task force. Um, we looked very closely at a study out of Michigan where they did a controlled study of those cheek swabs. Um, they did it in five counties over the course of a year. Here in Illinois, only Carol Stream road tested them, and that's kind of a small sample. It's not super useful. So we, we, we looked at the Michigan study. Um, and what they found is that the cheek swab was accurate. It matched the blood levels. Um, and so, you know, they've been rolling it out in greater use, but they also very smartly created a DUI task force and we created one as well and lucky me, I get to serve on it. And what it's going to do is continue to monitor that, that science and, and, and how that develops. The more we legalize and the more we, we relax restrictions on research at the federal level, the more we'll be able to do this smartly. Um, you know, another parallel that was raised, when you um, get pulled over for DUI and refuse to blow, you can either get your license suspended automatically or you could get this, I think it's called a DMMD, so you get a breathalyzer installed in your vehicle. Well, there's no equivalent for cannabis, so trying to figure out a way to, to come up with some sort of parallel process. So that's the kind of stuff that the DUI task force will work on and will continue to update our, our laws around it. Um, I heard that in the um, final negotiations, the um, regular people without a medical use um, being able to grow um, marijuana um, cannabis was negotiated out. Do you think that would be negotiated back in or somehow that would be amended? Or? Someday. Um, and that was probably my hardest give. I was really mad, frankly. Um, home grow kept my brother-in-law alive long past his expiration date, um, kept him able to have a relationship with my sister and their son. Um, and, and so having that access was critically important. He didn't have the money to have a medical card. He didn't sure didn't have the money to buy it that way, you know, from a dispensary. Um, and so, you know, that was, that was his way of staying alive. Breaking the law is how he stayed alive. So I did not want to give that up, but it was costing us votes. Um, and frankly, you know, there were a lot of people who were mad that we that we left it in even for medical patients, and it, it, that nearly killed the bill. And we just had to power through. Um, I think that once the sky doesn't fall, a lot of things will change. Um, you know, this is, and we said this a lot. This is the first bill. This isn't the end all be all. You know, every year since I've been in office, there have been dozens of alcohol related bills. And how long has it been since we lifted that prohibition? Um, my friend Leslie Herod in Colorado um, said that last year, in last session alone, I think there were 100 cannabis-related bills in Colorado. So this is going to be a work in progress. And, the, and so the things that we don't like about it, they're going to get tweaked. Um, the things that don't work will get fixed. Um, and so things like home grow, I think, will eventually will become a nothing burger. You know, the, the, one of the things I pointed out, looking at um, five plant, the, 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 the charges, statewide for five plants last year. I think it was 42 people or something like that. It was a very small number of people. Um, so, so this isn't all of a sudden gonna become rampant. You know, the requirements for home grow are pretty, pretty stringent. You gotta really wanna do it. So I, I think that that will loosen up at some point, but I can't tell you when. I saw a hand back here. I'm um, just curious on the pie chart. Uh-huh, um, I can go back. How were all of those percentages determined or where they Get the data to figure out how much each area could get. Was it not totally arbitrary, but a little bit? You know, right? Like, so, so you know, we looked at, for example, the public education and safety. How much is Colorado spending on that? You know, they've got a really robust public education campaign. What is, what's their budget for that? How much is that? So we tried to to fit it in in that way. Um, you know, and then a lot of it was how much segments were demanding. You know, it was really more about like, what are, this is a, it's more a statement of the priorities, right? We wanted to ensure that the R3 program was funded at a significant level. We wanted to make sure that the bill backlog was, was funded. Um, so it was really more in that approach, from that approach. That's how pies get cut, right? <laughs> Do you have a hand up too? Oh, no, okay. So one of the questions that I get quite often is, are we going to have a fix potentially, and you can go, Ms. Miles, um, on um, the communities that are on 
talked about. So for example, Diana's talking about um, Naperville, by the way, that group showed up today at the county board meeting as well. Um, because we're seeing where the medical licenses that, you know, they were gonna get first dibs with yeah. the presumption, and now they're unable to put the right. recreational dispensaries. Um, and so in my district, or in, and really in DuPage County, Addison is, is in, Lombard uh, is all in unanimous 6-0, and the only reason it's not seven is because one of their board members um, works in the medical industry, and so he you know, didn't get the position. But we're not seeing the, the growth that we had, so I keep getting asked, are we gonna have a fix on this? Um, I doubt that that's gonna be in this. Okay. Um, I would like to see, and this is what I get asked a lot for that, is the, that there, the, that if you opt out within some set period, you have to put it to a vote of the, of, uh, or to put it to a referendum. Um, and, and that seems the most fair approach. Uh, IML is whole, wholly opposed to, IML is the municipal league and then represent all the, the municipalities. Um, you know, that's what we had in there to begin with and that got taken out. So I would like to see a, a, a form of recourse. I don't know what that will look like yet, but it probably won't happen in veto. Um, the, the veto, the, the trailer bill in veto is really intended to fix errors. You know, a great example I give is that we, um, we switched uh, from, the, from calling it uh, processor to infuser. And so, but we missed one or two processors somewhere in the 610 pages. So we have to fix for that kind of stuff. People who've been calling me with ideas, I, I, I've said things like, I'm sorry, are you a misplaced semicolon? Because that's what's going on in this bill. It's really clean up. It's very, it's, it's, we're not um, replowing any ground. Um, I've gotten lots of requests, like the list of stuff from law enforcement was everything we said no to, including like home inspection for patients who are growing. And that's a absolutely hell no situation. You're not gonna come into my house anytime you want to kind of thing. Um, so, so nothing that's already been decided is gonna be relitigated because of the need to get a super majority. Because in order to get uh, immediate effective date, yeah, it was 68, 66, something like that. Um, and, and so we, we can't lose anybody and we need to gain more. Um, so, so that makes it very tight. We'll make our, our, our margins really tight. And I think we're out of time, but thank you so much. Thank this you has been for having me. Been extremely helpful. Thank you. Yes, I'm glad to be here. Well, along with that, um, is, is actually a very topical, our next speaker is extremely topical because we learned about one of the reasons why we have a huge disparity in justice. Um, but um, Renato Mariotti is a former assistant uh, United States attorney. Um, he, went to, he, um, he went to law school at Yale Law. He um, had a, has a political science from the University of Chicago. He has a whole variety of activities that are listed in your sheet. Um, and so in, I took a little bit of an article from the Daily Herald. He's one of the commentators on a variety of different channels. CNN is one of them and is a an, an very um, enlightening speaker. So thank you very much. All right, thanks for taking the time out. So I want to talk to you.